be useful. Um, for ACS, I don't know how much this will help because I've taken the ACS, but I don't know. ACS just has everything on it. So, um, so yeah, this shouldn't be your only study tool. Uh, good luck on studying for everything else. But for the first problem, uh, did you guys work through it already? All right, so while you do that, I'll work on it on the board. CH3, so it's just going to be this side and work. All right, CH3, it's going to be my first like corner right here, so then I go down one. CH2, CH, because another carbon, so one carbon, two carbon, three carbons. I've done that one, that one, that one. And then, one, two, three. And then I go down because it's CH3, CH2, CH. There's only going to be one hydrogen here. C. And then it's saying that we have an ethyl, or what is this? Three methyl X three. So it's saying on our third carbon we're gonna have an ethyl. Or, or a methyl, I mean. Whoops, why did I say ethyl? One, two, Jeez, I need to restart this because I just did it yesterday. I don't know how I messed this one up. Can you see this? I mean, the right answer is C. I don't know if you guys got that. But so I have CH3 right here. I have CH2. I have C. And then once I have C, I have a methyl right here. And then I have CH2, CH3. CH2, CH. Jeez, I should have done this. It's B? Yeah, I know, the substituent, which is why I'm like, I did this before, but it did not come out this way last time. And I swear, like, I had double check this, and it somehow ended up being C. So, all right, so C. Yeah, I, I double check this, because it looked like a trick question, which is why I put it on here, and C is the answer. Yeah, so like when you get your CH, you're going to have the double bond. Mm -hmm. So once you get your CH and you have your double bond, um, you're going to have your methyl sticking out, and then the rest of the chain continues down. Two more carbons. So it looks exactly like this. Like this is a methyl on three. This is what, oh wow, the thing's not focusing. Hexene, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So then three methyl right here. Yep. You're welcome. I'll look back at that problem before we finish because we'll probably have enough time. But uh, acidity, do you guys know how to check for acidity? Do you guys know the acronym? REO. REO. So REO. It's pretty simple, but I mean, it's, there's a couple exceptions to the rule. Uh, just do A is for atom, R is for resonance, I is for induction, and O is for orbitals. Um, when you use REO, right 
you first check for the atom. So looking at these, that this is the most important. It goes like most important A, R, I, O of like the order. Um, it er narrows down two options right off the back because two of them have NH or N and two of them don't. So you already know B and C are out. I don't know how to use this dot cam really, which is a problem. Like I click autofocus and that's all it's doing. Let me see if the zooming can help. Just don't do like your hand in and out like that because it's autofocus. Okay. Um, no, it's fine. All right, so B and C are automatically not a choice. So then you check for resonance between A and D. And when you see A and D, I mean, this pretty much narrows it down because you see there is no resonance structure in A. And there's resonance structure in D, so it's is more acidic. Uh, sorry that the dot cam isn't showing it, but I hope you guys can see it. But uh, all right, so number three. This one, a lot of people would just assume because they see a strong nucleophile that NABR is automatically just going to be SN2. But you have to look at the most important thing, and that's what the structure is, the leaving group. So the substrate itself is tertiary, so you know that can only be one thing, so it's SN1. Um, for number four, there's many different answers you could choose. Um, I would just, you guys could pick yours, I'll show you mine. But, and I could double check to see if you guys are right also. But I was going to say, another tip that people mess up a lot of time is when you do nomenclature, and there's double bonds and triple bonds, the one that will take priority is always double bonds over triple bonds. Um, all right, so when you're naming things, the numbering like one through five or whatever for pentene or pentine or whatever, you prefer to put the two or the secondary or double bond over the triple bond in numbering. People get that wrong all the time. So if they reach that carbon two on both sides, you pick the double bond over triple bond. All right, so this one, there is many different ways you can do it. Uh, OH, you know it's a bad leaving group, so you know you can protonate it, really easy option. So water, get rid of it. Um, but a really simple way, like a one step, would be just do HCN, the H itself will protonate the O or the OH, and then it becomes water. Or you could do something else, like this would literally just finish it by itself. Or you could do something else like tosylate it with PSCLPY. It's hard to see. So this would be a two-step. And then after you do that, you could just use NACN. So, TSCLPY turns OH into a good leaving group. Protonating OH will always turn it into a good leaving group. So you need to do that regardless, but there's many different ways. If you wanted, you could use like water and then something, but I just would, TSCLPY is safe. So I just always go for that. And then you also have to make sure that this one has no stereochemistry. If it did have stereochemistry between the first structure and the second structure, if the, uh, if the, con uh, configuration got inverted, then you'd have to do an SN2 reaction, which means you'd have to do uh, choice number one. So this is considered SN2 because TSLPY does not count for like one of the steps in determining if the actual product is SN2. But the strong nucleophile NACN could determine it if this was a, what's it called? So like this one's primary, so like I'm trying to point out that it's important for you to note that if it's primary, uh, you need to do an SN2 reaction, but this one doesn't really have stereochemistry, so it's not really showing it. But uh, so TSCLPY won't determine anything, but using NACN will do inversion of configuration, and you want to do that on a primary structure. So this one would be uh, preferable. Uh, this. I said it would work, but actually thinking about it, this is multi-step, this is SN1, 
Don't actually go for that. My bad. This one, yeah, like there's a lot of things where you'd think they work, but then you just need to make sure that the most important thing is is it primary, or secondary, tertiary. This one, we look at this, and we see that it's tertiary, so we know we need an S in one. So this one, yeah, HBR works because you want to protonate it. Um, if you don't want to do HBR, you can do just use any type of thing with H, like water, and then use NABR because then it's still multiple steps. This one, there is only one correct answer. Use NASH because you need the configuration inverted, backsided attack. All right, so the next problem, it just says, what is the systematic name of the following compound? This one shouldn't be too hard. Just, I'll give you guys a minute to try figuring that one out. All right, really good. So that is exactly it. It's 235 trimethyl heptuene. So two, three, five. So these are our substituents, and they're all methyls. So it's going to be trimethyl. And if you look at the longest chain, it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you know it's going to be hept. And then on the second carbon, you have a double bond. So it's going to be two ene. And I mean, we noticed that two, three, and five is where the methyls were. So that's how you get the full name. All right, so for number six, it's what is the expected major product? This one, uh, there's going to be a lot of problems like this at the end of just like synthesis, synthesis, which is good for you guys to practice. But there's always many ways to do things, but this is just telling you like these specific steps. So one equivalent of HCl, you know it's going to want to put the chlorine on the bigger side because this is Markovnikov addition. And Markovnikov addition means that when you do the actual, I'll draw the mechanism, the H wants to go to the side with more hydrogens. So I'll try drawing this really big. So when you have this, the actual arrow mechanism will go double bond, will attack the H. And then when the double bond attacks the H, for Markovnikov addition, you check to see which side has more hydrogens. Oh, I forgot to draw it. Um, so because this side has two hydrogens, you know that your H got added on this side, so like that's where that's going. So you're going to have a carbocation resting on this side. So that means once your CL broke off, you have a CL minus. Uh, don't forget to draw lone pairs if you're actually expected to draw mechanisms. Um, this is going to attack your carbocation. And then you do the same exact thing, but we have a one equivalent of HBR. So the H goes back over here. You're going to have a BR minus.
I didn't draw the H on like any of these to show where the H is going, but just know if you're getting rid of a double bond and there's a carbocation on one side, that means your H went to the other side. There's a nucleophilic attack, and then you are left with the final product. Did everyone get that? Okay. All right, so this is just like a definition thing about. Uh, For number six? All right, so for number six, when you have H and Br, you're going to have. One second. Let me make sure before I say anything. So you need to make sure it's anti addition. But the reason why I didn't show it is because you can't really show in hydrogen. So do you know what I'm saying? Like the hydrogen you don't show in line bond structure. So I just drew the BR there, and I just drew the CL there. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the BR and the CL, technically, they're all different groups. So you can show chirality, but it doesn't matter. Like One's wedge, one's dash, that's for sure. So yeah, writing that would be kind of important. It's just uh, knowing that the H and the BR are different is kind of important, but you can't actually show it to prove that. So when you conjugate a carbonyl group, so basically when you're looking at like the numbers for like a graph, when you see a carbonyl, C double bond O, that's carbonyl, and you see a double bond right next to it, that's conjugation. It'll shift it to a lower frequency, which gives it a longer wavelength on the IR spec. And then HDI, I don't know if you guys did this this semester. I feel like I didn't see that. But it's just a simple formula. It's, oh, I mean, I have the formula right now here. But you just plug everything in. So for this one, it is 1 half. You always put that there. Two times the amount of carbons, we have five carbons plus two plus amount of nitrogens. There is one nitrogen minus nine hydrogens. So you guys can do the math for that. That's pretty simple. 2n plus 2 for what? That's a formula for something else, I'm pretty sure. 2n plus 2, that's, what is that for again? 2n plus 2 is the, the maximum hydrogen you can have. But that one, it's different because it has nitrogen in it. So you have to use a different formula. Yeah, so this is just like degrees of saturation. So. Number nine works the exact same way. You just plug it into the formula. Um, I guess something important to know is interpreting what HDI is. If you have an HDI of zero, that means that you will have like no double bonds and no rings. If you have an HDI of one, you're going to have like at least one double bond or a ring. HDI of two two double bonds or two rings or one of each. Uh, and basically, that's how it's going to work for each number. But for HDI of four, you will have usually a benzene, I want to say. But it's just like, because it makes sense, you're going to have that many. Because yeah. there's a ring and then three double bonds. All right, so. This one is fairly simple. If you look at them, you're going to notice that they have almost all the exact same things in them, 
but this is a COC, which is vastly different than seeing an OH on a graph on the IR. So just seeing that they have an OH there, this one's going to be very obvious because it's going to have a strong broad peak. This one would not have that. So that lets you know that uh, these two are really different from each other when you look at the graph. Yeah, just for your information. Row number 11. OK, so this one, I'll just draw like over it so maybe it'll show on the dot cam. All right, so that's at 2,000. Um, where the peak goes down, seeing that it's a strong peak going down at 1710, we know that could only be a ketone. Um, I'll give out the values at the end of this for like, because maybe you guys don't have them for all the different functional groups and stuff. But 1710 is always just going to be a ketone uh, when it's strong like that. Uh, when you conjugate it, if you have a double bond next to it, you know it'll shift over by around 50. Uh, this is MZ. Um, you can see the last two peaks, the M plus 2, that it is 78 to 80. And it's got a like 3 to 1 size difference. So that just tells us that we're going to have a chlorine because that's the one that follows that. And then you could also just do the math and see like the fragment difference. So look at like the molecular weight of chlorine and subtract it from the base peak. And that should tell you like what's fragmenting off. I always see around 1650. You're welcome. Which is what the other problem earlier was saying about shifts to a lower frequency on number seven. Um, so number 13 is select the absorption bands you would expect to see below. Just looking at this. I can see that we have, so which one are you going to say is 3,300 out of the two things showing? Um, These. All right, so carboxylic acid will have 3,300. And then this is an SP hybridized CH. So Oh, so I was just like saying what you're saying. I have the actual thing written out. Um, 2,500 to 3,300 is the carboxylic acid. And then the SP hybridized CH is 3,300. The value for this one is 3,300. Uh, this one is 2,500 to 3,300. So your choices were B and C, or your answers were B and C. 
All right, so it says, which of the following does not represent a smaller charged fragment of the original molecule? So a radical cation, I mean, you know that's just a radical, so like, you know that's like something that's been broken off. I don't know, radicals like break apart. And then base peak, you know that like when we look at the graph over here, this biggest peak is the base peak. It's nowhere near the MZ. So because it's like clearly smaller, like 43 is smaller than 80, like you should be able to know that that's just a fragment of it. So the answer would be molecular ion for that. And then for number 15, true or false, do all of the following represent a positively charged species? Uh, you guys could think about that, that one second. I'm going to look at something real quick. So we know cations are positive. The base peak is positive. The molecular ion is positive. These are like just definition things. And the parent ion is positive. So your answer is going to be true. Number 16, um, the mass spectrum fragment that is observed from MZ43 of the following compound is, so drawing this out would make it much easier to see. CH3, CH2, 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 CH3, CH3, CH2, CH2. CH2, CH2. I'm just going to number the carbons because that makes this way easier. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. All right, 7. All right, so when you see the fragments, uh, I mean, looking at all of these, um, you could basically just check to see which one gives you 43, or you're supposed to check which one gives you 43. And out of all of these ones, do you guys know which one it is? Carbons, 12. Yep, B is the one, because carbon, you have three carbons times 12 is 36, and then you add all the hydrogens, that equals up to 43. So that's going to be your fragment. All right, so this one's saying what HDI means. The answer, since I already said it earlier, is going to be A. But HDI of 1 would be like answer choice B. Uh, Answer choice C would be HDI of 3. And then HDI of 4 would be for D. And like A, as I said, is the answer. And that's for HDI of 0. So 
HDI1 saturated just means one double bond or one ring. So just one of each or either of the two for HDI. Um, select the correct units of wave number and IR spec. So this is also just a definition thing. I have seen this on a test where they just put like CM and not like CM to the negative or yeah negative one, but yeah the answer is CM to the negative one. Okay, so peak that most likely represents the molecular ion. So molecular ion would be the like highest number. So it's going to be F. So that's pretty simple. Um, biggest peak is your base peak. Uh, MZ from molecular ion. Um, which of the following chemical shifts best indicates the presence of a carboxylic acid? Oh, so I like doing these ones because to just like memorize. So 12 ppm is your answer for COOH, carboxylic acid. So it's D. Um, I'll give out the values for what 2, 4, and 7 will be uh, after the words. So I don't think, I mean, maybe this would be an ACS question. I doubt like in Orgo 1, they're going to like get you with a question like this, but it's saying like which of the two is more acidic. Uh, NH2 normally you just say REOA, this one has N, so you know that's going to be the more acidic one. But alkynes trump that. It's one of the exceptions to the rule. So your answer is actually the one with the triple bond even though that's literally like A-R-I-O orbitals is the last one on the list, it still jumps it. And then for the second one, it is going to be your first choice. So looking at it, you can see that between this O and this O, like the charge is like bouncing back and forth between them. So that's making it uh, really poor. While this one actually can resonate between the two. So because this one can resonate between the two, this one is more acidic. So if you had your lone pairs here, and you tried double bonding like over here, this one would have one, two, three, four. It's basically like it can't like go between all three O's at the same time. I mean, it's going to want to like spread it out between all of them. But it's not forming like a stable resonance structure. I don't know how to word that better. It's because those are all just like next to each other. Like you never want to have uh, three O's next to each other. This is more acidic, just like something I know. Because like if you made this O negative, that's not really what you'd want, but. Yeah. Isn't that supposed to be like... Because you have an extra O? Yeah, because, because extra O, you should have more induction effect. In yeah, that's what I would think. Wait, A-R-I. I is induction. Yeah, so the, the, the first one doesn't have or does have induction. The first one doesn't have induction. The third one does, but... The atoms are like the same, so I look at resonance, and the resonance is better between uh, the first one. And resonance is more important than induction. Okay. 
Uh, number C, this is not technically like, it didn't print out correctly, so ignore C. For D, these both have the same A, so like you can't really choose that when you look at it. So you have R, I, and O. Just looking at this, I already know because of the double bond that orbitals makes this one the better choice. And then for F, we're comparing NH2 versus OH when we're looking at atoms. And the more acidic one is going to be OH. So this one is determining the relationship between The structures is ever going to work. All right, cool. So, if you were to name both the structures for the first two, you'd notice they have the exact same name. So, they're just constitutional isomers because one, two, three, four, five. So your BR hits at two, uh, wait, one, two, three, four. Or they don't have the exact same name. That's not what I meant to say. One, two, three, four, five. They have the exact same amount of carbons, hydrogens, and bromines. They're just rearranged differently. So constitutional isomers, just different arrangement. So this one is constitutional isomers. For B. This one also has all the exact same amount of carbons and hydrogens. And then, I mean, also you can kind of tell that because this one has the same amount of saturation as this one, same HDI, one ring versus one double bond. And they're going to have the same amount of carbons and hydrogens looking at it. So that's also constitutional isomers. Just rearranged. For Number C, these ones, if you go one, two, three, four. Actually, I put the numbers on the opposite side. But going one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep, just both of them have the exact same name. So if you ever get the exact same name, it's the exact same compound. So if you were to name that, that's just going to be 3-methylhexane for both of them. For D, um, this one, you pretty much can just, I mean, you can name it if you want to. But th both of them are just like wedged and dashes. Like they have anti uh, symmetry for the methyl groups. So, like I already did the configuration. This one's RR and this one's SS. So, what would you think that is then? All right, so everything changed. So, an anchimer. For this one, when I hit number carbon number two, I have an OH. For this one, when I hit carbon number three, I have an OH. So are they the exact same, or are they not the same? Oh, wait, I'm looking at, I'm comparing E to F. Whoops. All right, so one, two. All right, so for both of these, it just goes to one, two, three, four, five. Two pentanol. This one is one, two, three, four, five, two pentanol. So the same compound? Yep, exact same name, exact same compound. 
So then for f, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Um, one of these are wedge, one of these are dash. It didn't print out very well for me. But just because one has a wedge and one has a dash, it's still just going to be the exact same compound. So they are both 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 3 pentanol. Yep, it's the same. All right, so for G, this one has the chlorines on it. These ones are wedged. These ones are dashed. So if I were to label the stereochemistry, this is SR, and this is RS. I'll just draw out like how stereochemistry works for this. Or the priorities, I mean. So Cl gets one, this carbon gets two, this carbon gets three, and you know your H that's sitting in the back will get four. Some people like to draw it over here. I don't look at it when I actually go one through four, or I just go one through three. So I see it's going this direction, which is going to be uh, R. Wait, one second. One, two, three. It's going clockwise, but one, two, three. The H is in the back, though. So. Huh. so maybe I need to just check one more time. But I mean, it's pretty obvious how it's going to work, because they're both the exact same molecules, but like one's RS and one's SR is all I was trying to get at. So this one is one, two over here, and three. So like, it'll either be RS or SR. Um, for this one, since the H is in the back, this one's going to be R. And for this one, the H is in the back. So you don't have to invert it. It's RS. And if you were to look at the other molecule, you can see it's the exact same, but it's going to be like SR instead of RS. That's the only difference. So this one is RS, and this one is SR. And that makes them enantiomers because an enantiomer is just when you go from having two chirality centers and they change or like all the chirality centers change. And something like a diastereomer would be you keep one thing the same. Like you need at least one thing to stay the exact same. But any amount of things can change. Like, but you need something to change to be a diastereomer. So if you have like five chiral centers and one stays in R, but all the rest of them change to S, or like a couple of them change to S, then that's a diastereomer. So this one. So G is an enantiomer? Yes, G is an enantiomer. Or er, no, G's the same. Why did I say that? Whoops. It's the exact same compound, because if you look at the name, the name is going to be the exact same. Because if you label like 1 through uh, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you go. So G is the same, H is the same, 3. Uh, wedge dash. I can't really see how it's printed for. Oh, yeah, so then yeah, it would be the exact same, because it's just without chlorines. Yeah, these are the exact same. Because you can go from, uh, it'd be 2. For dichloro, no matter what you get, like they're both going to be RS or SR. It just depends which side you read it from. So they're both just two dichloro pentane. H works the exact same way, so you know it's going to be the same compound. This one, you would think it's constitutional isomers probably because you see the same amount of carbons and hydrogens. 
for i. But if one of them is cis and one is trans, that also counts as a diastereomer. For j, this one is r s, and this one is r r. It's kind of easy to see because it's just only one thing changed. So diastereomer also. I don't know if you guys are following that. I'll leave that up there for a second so you guys can see. Do you guys have any questions on these? Oh, G, if you read it from like left to right for one of them and you read the other one from right to left, because you can name it like one through five because it's hitting the same things on both sides, you're going to notice the name is going to be two, four, dichloropentane, no matter which way you look at it for both of them. So they have to be the same compound if they have the exact same name. B is constitutional isomers because you have the exact same, same amount of carbons and hydrogens and that's all you're looking at for this problem. And the only thing that changed is how they're arranged. So one of them has a ring, and one of them has a double bond. So they have the exact same degree of saturation. So they're constitutional isomers just because it's rearranged in a different way, but it's the exact same structure. You're welcome. Um, while you guys are copying that down, I'll ask the 23 like true and false questions. Are racemic mixture of enantiomers is optically inactive? The answer is true. And the light goes through when you have a racemic mixture. Uh, the time that you have a racemic mixture will be when you have an S and one reaction. It forms one product, or it forms two products always, and one will be an enantiomer of the other. And then a meso compound will have exactly one non-superimposable mirror image. Uh, so while you guys copy that down, I'm going to just look up a generic like meso compound, draw it out just to show you. I mean, I'll just say the answer is false. Uh, I didn't find like a really good meso compound, but I can show you how meso compounds work. If you ever have a plane of symmetry, that's a meso compound. Um, this can't have a non-superimposable mirror image. They can't have an enantiomer. Meso compounds don't have enantiomers. That's just a rule. Um, and when you have meso compounds, I want to find one that actually works well to explain this, but it doesn't really. Airplane.
Uh, yeah, it's hard to find one that actually works for this, but I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is a pretty good, no, I don't think it'll focus. Pretty good explanation for isomers. Um, let me see if I can get it to focus on it. So constitutional isomers, basically what this is saying is you have different structural arrangement, but you have all the exact same atoms. Stereoisomers have spatial uh, arrangement change, so you can have wedges and dashes changing, R and S, stuff like that. Um, diastereomers uh, can both be like the cis and trans thing that we referred to earlier, so if it's the exact same molecule but it's one cis, one trans, that's a diastereomer. And another way diastereomers work is when you have one part of the molecule configuration stay the same and the rest change or any amount of them change. And then enantiomers is you have every single plurality center configuration change from R to S or to S to R, no matter what it is. All right, so predicting the product, excess Na NH2. That turns whenever you have two halogens, either geminal or vicinal, turns them into an alkyne, triple bond. So I'm going to redraw this because you need to make sure you draw triple bonds straight because they will not ever be um, like at an angle, I guess. All right, so that's what step one will do. Okay, thanks. And then ETCL will add a chlorine to the side without the hydrogen over here. So it adds a terminal, or ETCL will alkylate terminal alkynes. This is terminal because there's nothing on the side of it. So one, two, the CL just goes away, just ethyl gets attached now. And then once you have H2 Lindlar's catalyst, that'll give you cis alkenes. So that's how A works. All right, so B, NH2 deprotonates the terminal alkyne. So that means this H is going away. That's what NaNH2 does. So you're going to have a lone pair sitting there. Which is what the NH2 did on the first one, too. But I mean, when you have excess, it'll get rid of both BRs and turn it into an alkyne. So this deprotonates it. And now you have a methyl iodine. That's just like a CH3. This is negatively charged. This wants to attack the positively charged methyl because the I is negative. So then 
you have H, C, C, and then there's like a CH3 attached. So then you have your agent 9BBN H2O2 uh, NaOH. So that is hydroboration oxidation. And it will turn our terminal alkyne into an aldehyde. So this is like the terminal side of the alkyne because there's just hydrogen sitting there. And now this gets turned into an aldehyde. So we have one carbon, two carbon, three carbon. So the point at which the alkyne starts is where the aldehyde be, uh, happens, I guess is what I should say. So because the, alde or the alkyne started at 2, that's where your aldehyde will be. So we go 1, 2, and then 1, 2, 3. One, two. I need to draw it like the other way around. This, this, all right. Here. Sorry, that looks kind of ugly. So we have carbon one right here, carbon two. This one has carbon one, carbon two, and then the next carbon over, over is the aldehyde. So C double bond O H. So you just need to make sure you put them in the right order. For C, it's doing the same thing again. NaNH2 gets rid of a hydrogen. doesn't matter which side you pick because they're both the same. ETI means you're going to have an ethyl being added using the same mechanism. I probably should have just drew it all line bond. I don't know, I'm mixing up both of them. So steps one and two will give you that. And then you have HGSO4, H2SO4, H2O. And that'll turn, uh, that's called acid catalyzed hydration. That'll turn your terminal alkyne into a ketone. So remember the rule again of count out the number until you hit like your triple bond, and then that's where your ketone will form. So one, two, three. So one, two. Might look ugly this way. One, two, three. So like your C double bond O should start where your three is. So one, two, three. C right here, double bond O. And then ketone, because this one forms ketone. That's number three is just like HGSO4, H2SO4, H2O. Both of those are just one whole thing. It's not like two steps. And then D. Does the same thing, deprotonate as a methyl, but you can see it's doing it again, deprotonating, but this time it's adding an ethyl. So the first step would have left us at this. The second step, or because these go together, whenever you see NaNH2 and it's not like excess, 
you know you're typically going to have like methyl iodide or like ethyl iodide or something. So those two steps go together, and these two steps go together. This first one gives you a methyl, the second one gives you an ethyl. But this last step is NaNH3 liquid ammonia, like that's what it is. So this gives you a trans alkene. So it's going to convert it into that. Anyone have any questions on these? All right, so propose a plausible synthesis for these. I'll let you work on that for a second, and then I will start on it. So my first step I would do would be counting the carbons because, I mean, you see you went from having a terminal alkyne to having something in the middle of your carbon chain. So this is one, two, I mean, I'm like doing it wrong side, but it doesn't really matter too much. One, two, three. Huh? Still hard to see. Like get closer. Or? You're welcome. One, two, three, four, five, six. So on your third carbon, you formed a ketone. And this is one, two, three, four carbons. So you know you added two carbons total. And on your third carbon, you want it to form a ketone. So you need to find reagents that'll both give you a ketone, and you need to find reagents that will terminally alkylate, give you two extra carbons. So earlier we said the reagent that can give us a ketone, but uh, the one for giving us extra carbons, I mean, we also did that one too. So acid catalyzed hydration will give a turn a terminal alkyne into a ketone, which is the H2SO4, H2O, HGSO4. So I just like writing out like what are the things I need to use eventually, and then we'll figure out the correct order. And then we need two carbons, so. Uh, one, two, three, four. I would do NaNH2 because 
you have a hydrogen sitting over here that you can deprotonate. So first step would be Na NH2. That deprotonates the hydrogen. So now you can alkylate it. So you can alkylate this with ETI, ethyl iodide. So that'll give us Also, this is synthesis, so there's more than one way to do this. So if you guys have any uh, answers, I can check to see if those ones work too. And once I have that, this will turn our alkyne into a ketone. Let me just double check to make sure this works on internal ones. Okay, well, one, two, three, four, one, two. One, two, three, carbonyl, one, two. So one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five. Did I have the right amount? One, two, three, four. Two, three, C double one O, four, five. So should have one extra carbon. So the ethyl got added to. Oh yeah, because I was doing it on the wrong side. Whoops. The ethyl got added onto this side, which is why it, it's going to be. This side has one more carbon than the other side. Um. I'll just do like one of these ones because these ones are a little bit different. The first step you want to do for this one is liquid ammonia for 26A. Because you see that it wants to be trans because looking at this configuration, it went like that. So that'll turn it into Transalkene for the first step. So Na, first step is one Na2 uh, over NH3L. The second step is Br2. And the reason why you know it's going to be Br2 instead of doing like HBr twice, stuff like that is because Br2 gives you anti-addition of Br's, bromines. And when you have anti-addition, the way the mechanism works is you have a Br attached to a Br. There'll be like one positively charged one and one negatively charged one because that's how they're bonded together. The double bond is negatively charged, so it's going to want to attack the bromine. This one breaks off. This will form a bridge between the, like where the double bond is, and it'll be the same stereochemistry. So like either wedges or dashes doesn't matter. But the important part is whenever you see that you have like Br2, um, you know you have this negatively charged Br that was left out here. So 
this Br minus wants to do an S and T reaction, backsided attack, and it will attack and form inversion of configuration and breaking the bridge. So then you'll have. Um, one second. All right, does that make sense? So, first step, uh, you turn it into a transalkene. Second step, you formed a bridge using Br2. The remaining Br minus will break the bridge and form anti addition. So, always remember you have anti addition when you have Br2. Just use, uh, liquid ammonia? Or do we still need hydrogen? Um, NaNH3, like liquid ammonia, will turn an alkyne into a transalkene, like. What do you mean by hydrogen? Do you mean like the H2 Lindlar's catalyst? Yeah. No, it's just liquid ammonia. Okay. Uh, I can show you a handout real quick that shows it. Oh, OK. So the next one you can see is really similar, but instead of having anti-addition of BRs, it's sin. So this one's going to work differently. You can do HBR for your first step. And it's going to get rid of one double bond. So H, B, R. This attacks, this breaks off. That gets rid of double bond. And then the Br minus will attack on one side. It's going to do the exact same thing again, but your second step will have to be HBr and peroxide. That way, it goes to the other side. So Br2 won't work for this, because that'll give it anti-addition. You need to use HBr and HBr and peroxide. Um, two separate steps to ever get uh, anti, or no, syn addition. But it doesn't matter if you use the one with peroxide first or second. You just need to make sure you use two different ones. Um. All right, so this next one is pretty simple because you can just do the addition of two OHs, sin addition, or is this sin or is this anti? That's sin. Sin addition of two OHs. So the reagent that'll do that is. Do they? Osmate. Um, I just want to double check because I know the H3O plus one, MCPBA H3O plus is the anti one. So like that's the answer for the next one. This one is. KMNO4 NaOH cold. There's two different, I don't know the other version of this, but KMNO4 NaOH cold does this. So you know that's going to be your last step, but that only works on alkenes, or it works on a double bond. If you were to do that to get rid of a double bond, you would still have a double bond at the end of your answer, so like that wouldn't work for just one step. But you could easily just turn this into either, well, actually, I can see here it's trans. So you want to use a reagent that will turn it into a trans alkene. So the first step will be NaNH3, liquid ammonia, to get a trans alkene. And then your second step will be KMNO4, NaOH, cold. All right, so for the next one, uh, when you have an alkyne, you can form an epoxide using MCPBA. As your first step. And then after you do that, you can use 
H3O plus to get anti-addition of OHs. So, or I mean, that's on a double bond. So this will be our two steps to form the, I always look at it as retrosynthesis. These are the two last steps you know you're going to need. But you're going to want to do this on a double bond uh, because if you did it on a triple bond, you would still have a double bond at the end. So get rid of one of the double bonds by turning this into a transalkene, or yeah, transalkene, which would be NH3 liquid ammonia again for your first step. So one, and then two, and then three. This one, you can look at the carbons and see that you have a different amount of carbons. So this is just two carbons. This is four. So we go back to deprotonating the terminal ends. So you can do Na, NH2. And then you just want to add a methyl on both sides. So this will be step one. Step two will be MEI, methyl iodide. And then you need to do it twice because you need both sides alkylated. So then. Step three, Na, NH2, four, MEI. So that'll give us this. So now we're back to basically what problem number C was, where we just have uh, dimethylacetylene, is the name of it. And we want to make it a syn addition of alcohols. So what we do is the same steps we did over here, which was NaNH2, liquid ammonia to turn it into a trans alkene. And then afterwards, we can use KMNO4 NaOH cold. And then we'll have the final product. Or I. Is that I? What number is that? No, that's E. Can't really read that. It's too hard to see. I think it's E. All right, so then for F, we know we're going to do the exact same thing we did before of NaNH2 methyl iodide, then do it one more time so that both sides will be alkylated. And this one is anti addition, so we'll use MCPBA H3O plus as steps three and four, or technically. Step one, two, three, four is the NaNH2 MEI. Do it again. So steps five will be MCPPA. Step six will be H3O plus. So identifying the products, if you have, oh, do you have a question on the ones from before? Yeah, why, so when we do that, how, do, how can, how do we know, how can we be so sure that we repeat the, you know, the procedure in three and four, but the same as one and two, right? Oh, because what it does is it picks up the hydrogen. You only have a hydrogen on one other side, so it just doesn't care which hydrogen it picks. So Step one will take a hydrogen from either side, and then you do like step two, alkylate it. Step three, there's only one other hydrogen it takes, so it's taking the remaining hydrogen. So there's going to be a lone pair sitting on the end of the alkyne, and then that's what's going to attack the methyl to pick up another methyl. So then identify the products. So you look at what position this is in. Is this tertiary? So you know that no matter what you do, you're going to do like SN1 or E1. This is a strong nucleophile and base, or weak nucleophile and weak base, because as a hydrogen. So like NaOET would be strong. This is just ETOH, so it's going to be weak. So on a tertiary uh, substrate with weak nucleophile, weak base, 
you will want to do uh, SN1 or well, SN1 and E1. But it's going to prefer to do, uh, I need to double check, but like I know it's going to form bo both products, but you're probably going to want to do your SN1 first, or as your major. So ETO. The BR is going to leave. And the carbocation will form. It's already in the tertiary position, so it's not going to rearrange anywhere, or not going to want to rearrange anywhere. And then you have ETOH ethanol. your carbocation is going to get attacked by your weak nucleophile. Um, for step, or problem B, OTS is what happens when you use TSCLPY on an alcohol. So this is already a good leaving group. It works leaves just as well as water does. And then you have NABR, and it's on a primary structure. Um, primary, we know it's going to be SN2, so it's going to do a backsided attack. But you can't really see stereochemistry there, so it doesn't really change much. But you know you're going to have a BR sitting there instead of a OTS. Like that's S and two. Um, number C, you have OH, so bad leaving group, but you have HCl, so you know it's going to pick up the H and become water. Is that, yeah, you're welcome. So like the lone pair from the OH is going to. Pick up the H, you will form water. Your water will leave. And you have your, when you had your H and CL, like I'll just draw the arrow going to the actual H here. The CL broke off. So like this is the first step that gives you water. Um, this is multiple steps because whenever you protonate OH, that counts as multiple steps, so you know it's S and 1. You're going to have a CL minus left over. And your CL minus is going to attack the carbocation that sits here. But you have to draw this out individually. So like, technically, it's not attacking right here just yet. You have to redraw it again. And your CL minus would actually be attacking over here. S and 1, make sure to draw all of these individually. Um, but that's not your only answer. It's going to be that plus the enantiomer. I don't think they're going to have you draw out the enantiomer. Usually they just let you do plus EN, plus probably multiple choice anyway. Um, a, a, a. I need to see it without like uh, all the drawing on it. Can you see what I'm looking at? Weak. Yeah. A should have enantiomer. Does A have heat in it or no? Because that's the weird thing. Um, I know it said the products 
for when you have weak nucleophile, weak base. If you have heat, uh, it'll prefer the E1 as the major product. But if you don't, it will prefer SN1. But normally when I see this problem, I normally see elimination as the major product, which is always what confused me. But I mean, it's supposed to form both products. It just says, uh, like in the old textbook, uh, the elimination product is very unlikely without heat, like really low yields or something like that. But A would have an enantiomer. Yes, any SN1 will have an enantiomer. Um, D, NACN, DMSO. So we see it's on a secondary, which means we have to look at what else we have. Secondary could be SN1 or SN2. And we know this is a strong nucleophile. So that pretty much usually tells us that we have an SN2. But the solvent also tells us DMSO is aprotic. That's also SN2. So I think that printed wrong. There's supposed to be some leaving group there. There's not a leaving group there. I just noticed that. So let's just say this is CL just because. So um, SN2, it's concerted. All of it happens at once. You have a BR minus. It's going to do a backsided attack. The CL is going to leave. And it's pretty much it. Like It's just going to be inverted configuration at this point. Oh, wait, yeah, I meant to put CN. Why did I put a BR? Yep, sorry, thanks. But yeah, like it'll just invert the configuration. It's going to be, it's supposed to be a CN, my bad. So identify the reagents you would use for the following transformations. Or no, that's 29. Before that, it's what is the most stable to least stable? So we see this one is secondary. This one, it is double bond, one carbon away, like conjugated away, carbocation. So that's going to be allylic. This one is primary. And this one is tertiary. So most stable would go allylic as your most stable. Second most stable is tertiary. Third is secondary. And then the least stable is going to be primary. OK, so the reagents you would use for the following reactor transformations would be OTS is a good leaving group. So you just want to add a OH. You see this is primary. So that means you're going to need to do an SN2 reaction. So it's just going to leave OH. SN2. So here, I would just use NaOH because this would be a strong nucleophile, and it just wants an OH added. If I were to use H2O, yeah, it would add on water. But I mean, the problem is that'd be SN1 because it has to do multiple steps. So NaOH minus. Er, like Na plus OH minus, that's all you'd have to use. So this next one, you have OH to CN. It is primary.
primary, so you know you need S and 2 again. So this one, you can just use, oh wait. See, if you use HCN here, it would do multiple steps, and it'd be S and 1. So you can't use HCN. But what you can do is you can tosylate it first. So T-S-E-L-P-Y is your first step. And then your second step can be N-A-C-N. All right, so this is tertiary, so we know this one wants S and 1. So easy way to do S and 1 is just put like H with a nucleophile. So we want BR added, so our only step is just going to be HBR. This next one, we see it's secondary, but the configuration got inverted. So we need a backside attack. We need S and 2. So all you have to do is do NASH. Um, I don't think they're ever going to have to require you to know like what uh, solvent you need, but I mean, you know it's going to be aprotic if you're doing SN2. So keep that in mind if it's multiple choice. This last one, it's like an Orgo 2 question, so I wouldn't even like worry about it. Like I don't think you guys have seen something like that before, right? Yeah. Okay, so reagents and like values. Do you guys want to see? Do you guys have all the um, reagents to do these things? Like, do you guys want to take a picture of this real quick? Like, I mean, this one's on the Stark WordPress, but like, this is one that I had like from myself that I made. Pretty sure all of that should be fine. Did I have this one right on this? This one. HCL. So identify the products. Protonated, secondary, so you're allowed to do that. Um, it's going to turn into water, leave, seal, minus, attack, and it's going to form plus enantiomer because this is S and 1. But I would write it as like the, it didn't change from wedge to dash because it's S and 1. Um, you saw it? Did you look at any of the other pages? Oh, this is like whatever you want in there. There's a lot of stuff. Uh, do you have any specific questions on anything else? This one is just like that, right? Just this will go here, this will leave, right? Yep, that's all it is. Just an invert, inversion of configuration S and 2, but like it, you can't really show it. Yeah, sure. Which one should pick one? Um, maybe no, like some of this, like maybe C or something. Like that. Uh, yeah, sure. Do you want that too? Oh, you can pass this. Um, yeah, I'll do that now. Which number is that? Um, Twenty-five. You said C. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we have time, we can go through all of it. Yeah. Mm, not really, unless, I mean, I was going to give out the PPM values. Do you so know them? Textbook. Yeah, you, you're fine with those? Um, no. Yeah, like 2, 4, 7, those ones. Oh, gosh. Those are like 12 carboxylic. Uh, 7, is that? No, I don't think so. 7 halogens? Or is it aldehydes? I'm, I need to check my um, notes. But, um, all right, so this one is... So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. So the amount of carbons changed. So something you can do here is, I know I need an alkene at the end. Uh, whenever I have two BRs, I know I can turn that into an alkyne, just to get rid of them. So this one maybe will exist in the NH2. Yeah, like that'll give me an alkyne. Okay. And then we add um MEI. Uh let me just draw it out real quick. One, 
One, two, three, four. So yeah, what you said sounds fine. Excess any NH two. Yeah, it wants to be trans, so good. OK, so then once we have this, this, uh, this, 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 then we'll turn to this, this. Wait, we're done, right? Did I? Is it on the right carbon? Did that finish it for you? Did that finish it for you? Or did I put it on the wrong carbon? Because I feel like I put it on the wrong carbon. Which one? I didn't pay attention. Um, yeah, I don't know why I have this sitting out here. Yeah, the liquid ammonia should finish it, right? Yeah, just three steps. So like the NaNH2, and then you add methyl, methyl iodide, and liquid, ammonia. liquid ammonia. Yeah, that should be fine. Do you want to do like E now or just one? For, for B, B. let's say for B, so we can do the same thing. We, we yeah. can make it alkyne. Mm -hmm. And what do we do after that? Does it, does it matter if we use like liquid ammonia or um, the little r? Because the there is nothing there. Yeah. So it doesn't, there's no chemistry. So as long as it just turns to an alkene, as long as you don't use the H2PT where it just turns out alkane, then you're fine. So, so use either or. So yeah. It's either little or or uh, liquid ammonia. Yeah. Right. Either one. Make sure you put H2 linlar. Mm -hmm. So either one of those are fine, but so you know how to do that one now? Okay. You know how to do B now? E? B. E? Yeah, you're fine with that one? Or should I do it anyway? Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, but we don't add any like methyl iodine. Yeah. Bacteria. What about F? So for D, we just, well, let's see. We'll just go through a bit, I think. For D, we just have to make it alkyne first. Yep. And then since it's ketone, we use the um, H2SO4 with uh, mercury sulfate, right? Uh, yep. That's okay. it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go. And for E, make alkyne. Alkyne. Then and then we make ketone. it. Whenever you see geminal or vicinal uh, dihalogens, alkynes is the easiest way to work with them. So for E, then we can we can we do that? We can just make it alkyne and we use Br2. Alkyne Br2, yep. That's all you need. It gets rid of one of the double bonds. So I'll just draw it like what happens. So here, here, here. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, it's gonna be straight. Whoops, my bad. One, two, three, and then. It's going to have one carbon, two carbon sticking out. So this, this. And then Br2 will get rid of one double bond and add a Br here and a Br here. So this, this. Uh, there you go. So. Yep. Really good. H G S O four H two S O four H Which water? Which H two O. So just remember a bunch of H's in there. So the the key one is the the mercury. Yeah. yeah. You have to have that. Do you wanna do F? Like the F then hmm. I mean you know it's an alkyne first, so This, 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 this. Uh, ignore the fact that I'm drawing an angle. That's it's supposed to be straight every time. I would just do that on reaction at this point. OK, so we want an OH on. So I see like easiest way is retrosynthesis. We know we could easily get this from having a the last step looking like this, just a terminal double bond. Mm -hmm. And then you add an H and an OH, really simple. So like H3O plus or something like that, then you're done. So how do I turn this triple bond into this double bond? Just use any, you know, like liquid ammonia. 
All right, good. Either one, because it's terminal anyway, doesn't matter. So. Diluted acid of? Uh, like it, it's, it's three of like H3O plus, yeah. Hydronium, yeah. Hydronium ion. Yeah. All right, so to clarify, first step would be excess NaNH2. Uh, second step was? Um, liquid ammonia? Yeah, so NaNH3L. Third one, H3O plus. Let me just make sure that adds it to the, what do we want, Markovnikov? Yeah, we want Markovnikov. Let me just make sure it's Markovnikov. Yeah. So if, if we want it at the end, then we'll make it um, hydrogen peroxide, right? Because it's anti Um, That won't work in this situation. There's a different reagent for that. Uh, so H3O plus is what we work or use because we got Markovnikov addition of an H and an OH. But if we want anti-Markovnikov addition, we use first step BH3, THF, second step H2O2, NaOH. So that's how you get the H or OH on the other side. Is BH3, THF is your first step? THF. Yeah, and then second step is H2O2 NaOH. So then we can use the um, 9 BBN. 9 BBN um, for what? I think that's a different type of thing. Oh, another thing you could have used here would be HgOAC2, H2O NaBH4. That would have worked also. That also does the same thing as H3O plus, except it won't have um, rearrangement, which doesn't really matter in this case. So they both do the same thing. They both could be your last step. So there's many different answers you can have. Um, any problem throughout this that you guys were unsure of? Because I skipped some because I didn't know how much we were going to get through. Yeah, let me just get them real quick. All right, so carboxylic COOH is going to equal about 12. Um, I've written down, but I just want to see if, I'll just look at this graph. C, double bond C, so X. So 8.5 is aldehyde. Um, if you have a halogen, that's four. like written down on one of these. I wonder if this will actually show up on the thing. All right, there you go. That's, that's what I'm looking at right now. I don't know if this makes any sense to you. So right here, the carboxylic was 12. Aldehyde, 8.5. Uh, 
uh, benzene, which is considered a sp 2 CH bond, I believe, is like 7. But then just a normal sp2, like the one in a benzene is 7. Um, normal sp2 hybridized CH bond is like almost 6. Uh, this is reading like, this is HNMR, so it's like reading the hydrogens bonded to things. Uh, H bonded to a carbon, bonded to a halogen is going to be 4, but also H bonded to a carbon bonded to an oxygen is also 4. So like it's just reading the H that's connected to CO or CX, those are 4. HCN and HCS are 2.5. Uh, SP hybridized CH is 2.5 also. A methyl CH2 and a CH are all just going to be under one. And then, do you guys understand like carbocation rearrangement? Okay. Do you guys understand? Let me see what else I have. This is what I was looking for this whole time of the values. Is carboxylic acid that high? Yeah, it's 12. Oh, no, not that low. I thought carboxylic acid is above 3,000. Where are you looking at? Uh, number 13. I thought this one is 3,000 3, and above. Um, it was 2,500 to 3,300. Oh, really? Hmm. And then this one is just 3,300. Like this one has a range that it could be in, and this mm -hmm. one is always just going to be 3,300. Okay. I can double check if you'd like. I, I mean, I will, but. Carboxylic acid, IRP. Well, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I might be wrong. But All right, so this is the one. I don't know if it'll show up on here. It's gonna okay. if you have it on there, then oh. All right, so carboxylic acid right here. It says 3,000, 2,500 right here. Oh, okay. So that's good. Thank you. You're welcome. So then the other one was 3,300 is always going to be your SP. SP, yeah. Um, anything specific from there that you guys need help on? Um, what about OH? Does it have anything in particular for OH, or is it just broad? OH will always be broad. There's only three things you'll see that are broad. Carboxylic OHs and alcohol OHs. Um, the other third thing is NH. It's not strong, though. NH goes like halfway down the graph. Uh, OH will always go all the way down. Those are the three broad things you'll see. So if you ever see a broad, fat, whatever, it's going to be OH or NH. If it goes all the way down, it's going to be an OH. You've got to look at if you have on your graph also in the 1710 region, you have a carbonyl, which means carbonyl with an OH. What is that? Carboxylic, carboxylic acid. If you don't have that, you just have an alcohol. Yeah. So mm. that's how you determine OHs and NHs. Like. So alcohol is in what, uh, what range? Alcohols like 2,900, 3,000? Let me check. Alcohols are in the uh,
Yeah, like they're around 3,000. So like 2,500 to 3,000 is the carboxylic acid, but if it's just OH by itself, it's 3,500 to 3, 3,550. 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. um, I don't know, do you have any other questions like that? Because then I can give you other tips that. Well, anything. I know. I'm, I need like something general so I can give you like what I use to remember it. Like nothing comes to mind, on top of my head. Um, yeah, nothing comes to mind. So the molecular ion is also the highest. Always the highest. No, base peak is the highest. Molecular ion is the last number. It's the MZ value. It's the, or it's like the highest number, but like the highest peak itself is base peak. Mm -hmm. The biggest number is the MZ, the molecular ion. I think so. And then like your MZ plus two and stuff, that's like with neutrons added or something like that. So, gotcha. or your M plus two, whatever you call it. That's where you get like CL, CR. Yeah. Um, Aspect uh, for fragment that is observed from this. So we know we're going to cut it like this, right? But yeah. Are we talking about this one or that one? The one that equals 43. So, like, you just add it up. Okay. It's going to be, we're going to need, what, three carbons in there? Mm -hmm. so, so, one, two, three. Yeah, I know that, but the thing, I, I don't know, like, when they say fragment, so both of them are fragments. Yeah, but the fragment's a smaller part usually. Mm, okay. So. Yeah, that's just how I think of it. Um, anything that you guys struggle on in particular that I can just give a brief summary on how to do it since I can do that now? Um, like, definitely mass spec. Oh, yeah, that's, that was my Orgo 2 stuff. I like didn't take it in Orgo 1. Like, that wasn't my Orgo 1 stuff. I didn't even know that was going to be something I had to teach. Oh. So it's like not my thing. I don't know either. I don't like it. Uh, Crowdy centers, maybe? I don't know. Drawing in an enantiomer, do you guys know how to do that? Pretty much. Um, let's see. So do you know like the IR values you'd get for number 10? Yeah, so. Um, twenty-five to thirty-five fifty or something like that. Um, thirty-two to thirty-five fifty. Thirty. Oh, thirty-two to thirty-five fifty. I always see it like in three three hundred, so I just know from that. But yeah, thirty-two hundred to thirty-five fifty. Thirty-five fifty. Thirty-two hundred to thirty-five fifty. All right. So what are we getting here? What is this? What type of bond is that? Where it's gonna. That's ether. ether. No problem.
so ether would be at a, do they not have a specific value? Um, Probably in the 1700 range. I mean, I'm not sure though. It's, it's, it's about like 1300. 1300? All right, so. Yeah, that's why I don't know the value, because like, yeah. I've never seen that. Yeah, so like what that one would just not have the range, because it's pretty much how you do it. Basically, yeah. you can't really tell. Yeah. yeah, like you don't really need to know that. You just know that OH just gives it a dead giveaway, so. And then I guess there's like this little vampire teeth looking thing that you'll see for amines. Um, the, another thing is am or when you have nitrogen in something, the weight is going to be what? You guys remember? That's odd number. Odd number. So what else is there? If you go to the Orgo 2 review, uh, Jesse is also going over IR and stuff like that because it's also an Orgo 2 thing still. Both will work. All, either one will work? Okay. Either one works. Yeah, okay. Like, I know my friend used this simple one. I use this one because it's the one that I saw online and I've been using it forever, so. Yeah. But they both work. This one is pumped right into, so you just remember this one and you can plug Yeah, you anything. just plug it in. Yeah. And you just know one, two, three, four, whatever you get, yeah. zero. Like. Yeah. So just the other one, they don't incorporate, you know, like. Nitrogens and. So, I haven't covered what, HDI? This thing, the, the HDI, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh it's going to be an Orco 2 at least. Well, chapter 15, we haven't even started. Nah. Yeah. That was like on our first exam, Orco 2. <laughs> hmm. But yeah, I mean, that's pretty much all the time we have. I don't know if we have like time for like one more question. I don't know if you guys can think of anything. Oh, yeah, I should, that's a simple thing I could explain. All right, cool. The neighbor. All right, so if you have, let me find, I'll just draw on the back of something. So if you have like this or whatever, uh, this right here would have one, two, two neighboring hydrogens. So this makes this carbon a triplet because it's plus one. While if you look at this one, this carbon would have one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So sextet, six, or multiplet. I don't. He like Kumomi says either. But because because they're not equal, they're not the same hydrogen, right? Yeah. So we use three plus one times. I've never heard that. Two plus one. No, that's not. I've never seen that. It's just you do multiply. It's you add all of it up. So three plus two, so five, and then you do plus one. Is what I've always seen. Um, but they're not symmetrical. You can't do that, right? I if, don't know. If when they're not symmetrical, I just hear multiply usually. Because if you have like just this, oh. right? If you have just like like just this, and you talk about you know the one in the middle, the then both of this will you can just count six of them and plus one. Okay. Yeah, because it's symmetrical. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that one is not symmetrical because when you look on the left, it, you have th three hydrogen. On the right, you two. have two. Okay. So it's not symmetrical. It's. So how many? Um. If I, I, don't, I can't remember for sure. All right, so I, if I'm not mistaken, that you have to count it differently. They use it, the textbook use like m plus one times n plus one or something like that. And then you know how to count it. Like Kimomi said, there's two different ways. Like let's say you have a carbonyl here. What is this going to be? What is this going to be? 
So you have one, two, three, four, quartet. Uh -huh. um, he sometimes said like you count like the one extra or whatever, but like I don't, I've never seen that before, so. So I would always just say quartet for this. How much is this one? And then this one is? Singlet, there you go. There's no hydrogens neighboring, there you go. All right, so that's pretty much it. Thanks for coming. All right, thank you, appreciate it. Welcome. Sorry my, um, it's called. The orgo2knowledge wasn't there because I'm not orgo person. <laughs>